You're listening to Maximum Medicine Radio with host Doc Martin. Stay tuned in or call in. You won't want to miss what's happening next. How do you step into your maximum potential? How do you connect your spiritual drive with your physical path? Stick around as Doc Martin takes listeners on a journey through the seen and unseen, the accepted and the unbelievable. Get ready to meet the maximum you the world needs on Maximum Medicine Radio with Doc Martin now. Hi, everybody. I'm Doc Martin, Maximum Medicine Radio. I'm here with Peter Woodbury, and we're going to talk about something that I love. He is a hypnotherapist, but he specializes in hypnotherapy for past life regression. And Peter was a Bostonian once upon a time and somehow got called down to uh, Virginia Beach, um, where he's closely associated with the ARE, uh, Edgar Casey's organization. Peter, I want, if you would, take a minute to say how you left New England and made your way down to a very different culture of Virginia Beach. Well, um, that's a, I don't even know where to start that story. Uh, I found out about Edgar Casey when I was in college. And so, you know, I was going to college in New England in, in the Boston area. And um, I went and started to explore uh, this guy, Edgar Casey, but I, I didn't have the time to really go into depth. And so it wasn't until after I graduated, actually I had finished college and then I went to get a master's degree in social work. And then I went to a lecture at, by the way, it was like a, it was like a new age center in Boston for a while. This must have been in the nineties. And it's, not, it's no longer there, but Harmon Bro was giving a lecture about Edgar Casey. And so then he talked about, uh, again, Mr. Casey, so that I went and read There is a River, and I just got hooked because it, it really synthesized a lot of, uh, I was born and raised Catholic, and, mm-hmm. but I had kind of outgrown Catholicism, and I'd learned about meditation and Buddhism and Eastern religions, and so I didn't find a, a rubric to kind of connect all of these different ways, you know, different spiritual traditions that I was learning about. But in Edgar Casey's view, I found a place where they fit together. So I joined the organization. And then in Massachusetts, they had these um, local chapters and they had something called search for God groups. And so I joined a search for God group and it started to feel like that's where my true self was. And I felt like, you know, Boston can be very intellectual and it's mm-hmm. kind of um, suppressing a bit of anything uh, yeah. new, new agey or creative. And so so I started feeling that my true self was in this Casey community. And so I decided I wanted to move to Virginia Beach to really be part of uh, the organization, the ARE and the work. And so I moved down here 20 years ago to pursue that, uh, that dream. Mm-hmm. So for the listeners who aren't familiar, I'm, I myself am very familiar with Edgar Casey and his story and his teachings are very moving and mm-hmm. they ring true for me. But just briefly, who who was Edgar Casey? Well, um, he was uh, he was born in rural Kentucky in uh, 1877, and he was born with very unusual psychic abilities that it took him a while to realize other people didn't have. Like he would see uh, angels, he could see auras, he could communicate, he could pick up people's thoughts, he could um, see the deceased. And so his nickname was The Freak. And there was a broad off-Broadway play written about him called The Freak. But so he kind of tried to suppress this ability and he didn't want to be seen as unusual. But what happened is that he, um, when he was about 20 years old, he lost his voice. And he lost his voice for about nine months. And they tried all sorts of things. There was no medical cause that they could find. But then they tried hypnosis. And then when he was in a trance state, he could speak in a normal voice, but then he'd come out and he'd lose it again. And so they kept working with hypnosis until at one point he got into such a deep trance that he diagnosed himself, his condition. He basically said it was uh, psychosomatic and he, was a, he had a fear of expressing himself and that it was related to um, 
you know, that, that somehow he had gotten in trouble in the past with, with speaking up. And so the direction was given for him to, you know, tell the hypnotist was to tell him, you know, return the blood flow to normal and balanced conditions in the throat. And his throat turned bright red when the, when the blood came back to his throat and he came out of the trance and he could speak in a normal voice. But the doctors, the people that were involved with this hypnosis, they were so curious, they started to ask about their patients. They put them under trance and they asking about their patients that didn't seem to be responding to any conventional treatments. And he started giving what were called readings. So in the trance state, he could you know, somehow scan a person's body. He could say what was wrong with the body physically. But then he was also, he's considered the father of holistic medicine because he was able to talk about mental conditions like anger, how that was playing out in the body or jealousy or rage. And then he was also talked about uh, spiritual uh, importance, spiritual things that a person had to do to become healthy. So that's why a lot of times he's, there's a mind, body, spirit um, connection with Casey. But he gave, I think over, uh, his 40 years of his life, he gave over 13,000 or 14,000 of these readings. Most of them were for health, but he started giving readings on all different sorts of subjects. And again, it was in the trance state, he seemed to be able to access a level of, of consciousness, which would allow him to be able to answer. Well, a little bit of internet technical difficulty, maybe the hurricane sending some vibes as far north as <laughs> the beach. But the, mm -hmm. Edgar Casey, what I love about him, many things I love about him, is first of all, the power of his ability to predict and to mm -hmm. know, but that he also taught us that when we go into the deeper and access the subconscious, that knowledge is available to us. Mm -hmm. And he was very big on, um, it was never a top-down prescribing. It was a mm -hmm. very much, here's what you can do for yourself. And one mm -hmm. of the things that he, he was very, he also talked about, you know much more than I do, about that you can do self-hypnosis um, and get your, yourself, bypass your mental stuff and go into the deep and help turn things around. Um, mm -hmm. What I also love is that he brought spirituality, even though I understand he was a deep, deeply devout Christian, he read the Bible multiple times, cover to cover, but he understood the value of spirituality. And I know that when you started doing hypnosis, did you recognize the spiritual value of it? Yes, I, I, I didn't ever really um, use hypnosis for like smoking cessation or weight loss. I, I went right into um, it was it was synchronistic, you know, coincidental synchronistic. That when I got to ARE, I got a job as the conference facilitator. So I facilitated for four years. They had an annual past life regression training. So they gave me an honorary degree after just attending it. You know, I would be the guy that would bring in the snacks and that sort of thing, and um, I just attended it. And so from there, I got curious because I got to watch the sessions that the demonstrations they were doing. And so then I began to try it myself. And um, at first, the sessions were purely past life. But let's step forward. I know that one of the things that you were um, steered towards and mm -hmm. um, is you trained with Brian Weiss. Yes. And did you know about hypnosis for past lives at that time? Or yes. Yes, I had already been practicing before I went to Brian Weiss's training. I went to Brian Weiss's training at a time where it was I was preparing to start to teach. And so I wanted to see how other people would teach regression. And so I got to see it from that, uh, that perspective. Mm -hmm. I got to see his work. I mean, Brian is, is, he's more than a past life regressionist. He's a spiritual master. I mean, it, it, people took his class year after year after year just to be in his presence he's just a very um special special person mm -hmm. so i was very yeah. blessed to take that class with him mm -hmm. um and everybody probably remembers um his book brian weiss's book where he describes the patient who 
who basically opened his eyes to the power of finding out uh, past lives. Yes, many um, lives, many masters, yeah. Right. I want to talk more about that in just a minute. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back to hear more about past life and regression and what it can teach us. We'll be right back. Hi everyone, we're back. I'm Doc Martin, Maximum Medicine Radio here with Peter Woodbury. And we're talking about hypnotherapy for past life regression. So Peter, I want to know, like, first of all, how did you come to know for yourself that past lives existed? That's one thing. And then what is the value of knowing them? Um, you know, I, I wasn't raised in a family or in a culture or in a religion that believed in, in past lives and reincarnation. So it was through the work of Edgar Cayce that I began to entertain the idea. And then I found out that Edgar Cayce too, he struggled with that, with the idea of reincarnation because it's, it's not explicit in, in the Bible. You know, you can, some people will say, or it's been said that it was in the Bible was taken out, but just with my upbringing, I didn't have a, a framework for it. But, you know, reading Edgar Cayce, I began to become open to the possibility of it, you know, and it's like, um, I think if you want to think that life is that, that somehow there's justice in, in, in the world, that God is fair. It's hard to think that life is fair when, if you look at the snapshot right now of the world, it's like, you know, I haven't missed many meals. You know, I've had a rather fortunate life and there's certainly people that are living completely different lives. And it just doesn't seem fair to think that that would be the ultimate truth. But with reincarnation, you get some idea that we, we, we try out different experiences. We learn from all of the variety of, of life experiences, of genders, of races, of culture, of class. And so intellectually and spiritually, that made sense to me. And then also as a, as a Catholic or as a Christian, I believe that we had an, uh, uh, an eternal soul and that my soul would live on after my death. But if it's eternal, it has to have had an existence before my physical birth. So those, those ideas began to entertain for me intellectually the possibility that your soul has a life beyond your physical life. And then through witnessing regressions and how vivid those experiences were for people, you know, first of all, watching it through other people conducting those sessions. And then I got my own, like before I started actually being professional, I had my own regressions and I started to have very significant experiences that were very helpful for me. Like my parents were psychiatrists. And so I've been, I've done plenty of talk therapy and talk therapy is really great, but there's certain things that you, you might be able to get into ch this life, your childhood, but I'll give you an example. I have a sister that I've never been very close to. I've never trusted. Now she's never done anything that merits that. I just haven't trusted her. And I never worked on it in counseling because I just thought it was normal. But it was actually at Brian Weiss's training where I was practicing with a student and I saw this experience. I saw myself training to be a priest in Ireland. And I was very unhappy. I really, I didn't feel like I wanted to be here. It wasn't, felt like it was forced upon me. And then the person, the student regressing me said, well, how did you get here? And then I saw myself as a little boy being dropped off at an orphanage, I was being put up for adoption. And I looked over to see my parents. And I saw that my mother was my sister, my sister in this life, who I never trusted was my mother in, in that life. And it hit me immediately. No wonder I don't trust my sister. Because, you know, unconsciously, I still remembered that she had dumped me at the orphanage. But the healing purpose of it, the way that it was healing, is that when you an effective regression is, is spiritual, because you're not just yourself, you move into the oneness. So I was able to experience my sister's feelings. And I was able to feel that she was horrified. She had 12 kids, they couldn't feed all of them. It wasn't personal. The, the little boy, me as that little boy felt rejected. I was very angry and afraid. But I didn't understand I was a little kid. How could I understand that my mother and parents were faced with this difficult decision. And it was happening throughout Ireland. It just people were having more kids than they could uh, afford to raise. So I immediately forgave my sister. 
I realized it was just a misunderstanding. So when I came out of the regression, I called my sister within days and tried to reconnect with her. So that to me showed me how powerful a regression can be because we can have resentments and grudges and issues that there's no way we can, they don't come from this lifetime. There's no way we can get to them. And it's like, what happens when you, when, you, when you do a regression, you dare to do a regression, it bubbles up. What's most important to you is going to bubble up into your consciousness, and it'll bring some gift to you. It'll help you work something through. I have, I have many, many examples I could share about that. I think also what's so wonderful about it is when you're floating past your human intellectual mind, then you were able to hit that observer state, as you said, in the oneness and um, reach of forgiveness because you're floating above it. You're mm -hmm. seeing like the ants yes. through the yes. ant farm and you're yes. seeing the bigger divine picture at play. Um, and that, that's an amazing awareness. That's what um, I say. I say our injuries happen from our individual perspective, but healing happens in the oneness. Healing happens when you see the whole picture. So I'll just share uh, with the listeners. I did uh, Peter's past life regression class. Oh gosh, years, I'm going to say six years ago at Virginia Beach. And I, I happened to be one of the people that was chosen to go up on stage. And this is kind of funny. This, and um, we drew, the, he drew names and um, he called a woman sitting next to me. And then he drew with an X name and called me and the whole class was furious that something's rigged that you pick two people out of the same place of the room. But I, you know, I said, when I got up in the stage, I said, no, I was sending my signals to be picked and I hadn't determined strong enough. It's me right here. But anyway, <laughs> So he, in the past life regression, I had, I experienced um, a rape and the people, uh, the three men who um, abused me, one was my father and one was a man that I had loved and later betrayed me in this lifetime. Um, and you asked me, you know, are you still angry? And I said, and I said something to the effect of no, the whole point of me having allowed myself to be raped, in other words, I saw the conscious um, willingness to do that was for them to learn. And I mean, this came out of my, I mean, this came out of my mouth unbeknownst mm -hmm. to my mind. Mm -hmm. But anyway, afterwards, when I processed it, it was so powerful to see that the places we land in our lifetime and the experiences we have have a value that when you're in it and you're suffering, you don't necessarily see the value, but when you float above it, yeah. um, and that's what, it, that's what a hypnosis can do. So I love, I love that. Yeah, you know, I've, I've conducted maybe 6,000 regressions. I remember vividly like 20 of them and yours was one because it was so powerful. I remember while you were being raped, you said, it's my husband. I think you said, it's my husband. And you became aware of the soul contract you had with him. And you were, you were going to reincarnate with him to help him grow. And I think you said he's getting better. Like he wasn't perfect in this life that you had with him, but he wasn't as bad. So you were able to see the soul progression and that somehow this commitment you had made to him was being fruitful. It was a, it was a fantastic, uh, learning for all of us and what was so wonderful is i knew when i took the class that it was going to be very important for me to be regressed because something powerful was going to come through mm -hmm. i mean i just knew that ahead of time so when you missed me and picked the woman next to me i was you know telling spirit a uh, little bit of, move a little to the to the right here yeah but yeah. um I love, I love the access to that higher knowledge, to that um, forgiveness, to the love despite all the bad things that happen. Um, and yeah. that's what I think, I think and, we can do. And I wouldn't want anyone listening to, 
to think that this is like a victim blaming that, that anyone, for people not to think that anyone who's been raped, it's like some pre-life planning. It, it, there's always different conditions. So it's not like one size fits all. But if you have suffered trauma, it's helpful, you know, if you've done your conscious work, but in this kind of work, you can get a, an understanding of what may have been a lesson or what may have been a learning that happened, but it's not about, you know, it may be about seeking justice or retribution. You know, there, there, there's not one size fits all. So I wouldn't want someone to think that it's always that a person who's raped has a contract with the right. rapist to, to right. do that. That'd be important for me to share, to make clear. I think that's, that is important. Mm -hmm. And that um, I think not everybody will float to that place of a forgiveness with an understanding. Um, and with something has, that has happened to you that's so traumatic, um, it may take yes. a while for you to get to that place. And that well, does- I certainly had, mm -hmm. go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I've certainly had other regressions where a person remembers past lives with a significant person in their life, a husband, and they remember past lives where, where things were, were worse and that they realize they do have a soul contract with this individual to try to help them. And usually it's helpful because it sees like as bad as their, their ex-husband is in this life, it helps them say, okay, well, they're, they're making progress. You know, it's like they're they're not as bad as they were the last lifetime, but it's, you know, it's interesting how, you know, as souls, we're just, we love people so much. You know, we, we come into our families. Oftentimes we come into these horrific abusive situations that a lot of times we come almost like, like Christ figures. We come to give love where there's only hate given to us. You know, it's like, I think on every soul path, eventually we have a Christ-like path where we, we really don't get much and we give a lot in return. That seems like almost like the culminating life experience for a soul. Right, I love that. Um, mm -hmm. We're gonna take a short break and when I come back, I want to talk more about um, what you've learned in regression about where do the souls go and how do they decide the next lifetime, what you've learned about that and a little mm -hmm. more about soul contract. So we'll be right back after a short break. Okay, everybody, we're back. I'm Doc Martin. I'm here with Peter Woodbury. We're having a great conversation, not only about hypnosis and hypnosis for past life regression, but what it teaches us about our spiritual life. And I want Peter to spend a little time sharing what he knows about that space between lives. Um, what is the soul doing before it comes back? So Peter, tell us a little of what you've learned. Well, let me go. Um, I'll go from the end of life and then to the in-between life state and then into the planning for the next life. So it seems like when we, after we finish a lifetime, there's like a, a review. We kind of go over kind of what goals we set for a lifetime and kind of what, what we accomplished, maybe what, what goals we didn't quite reach. But what I've learned is that the only judge is your own self like your own soul self. There's no, there's no external judgment. Like I say, life is a self-graded exam. So when you're, you've, you're the one who's planned your life before you're incarnated, you worked on the, basically the reason you're wanting to work through your karma is because as long as you have karma, you're attached to this dimension, this school. And so you graduate from the school by working through your karma. So that's the motivation that you have. Why, why you, why we keep coming back here. And so in a lifetime, you've you planned the work you want to do. You came in and you might you knew you were going to meet your husband, your wife. You knew you were going to have your family. You knew there, were, there were going to be all these issues. There are going to be these challenges and these uh, these you know, great opportunities. And how you made use of them, you you evaluate. But again, the only judge is your own self. So there's no external judgment. It's almost like here here I I did fine. Oops, I still got to work with this. I didn't forgive this person. I I kept this grudge. Whatever it is. And so then you know that that's what you still have left to do. Now, the, the real in-between life experience, I don't believe it's accessible while we're in a physical body. 
I think that when you contact your guides, you're just doing that every night we contact our guides. So we have our guides with us during a whole incarnation. But what happens in the in-between life experience, what Edgar Casey talks about is that we leave the energy field or the school of earth. And we go into the university system, which is the other planets. So we've had an incarnation in earth. And then you sort of have an incarnation in Venus and Saturn and Mars and Pluto and these different realms. But they're not incarnations because carne means flesh. So the, this is the only dimension that we enter materiality. We enter these other planetary uh, influences, we enter them in a state of a consciousness, so mentally and spiritually. And it seems like in each of these dimensions of learning, we gain some sort of ability. So let's say, let's say you've gone through your life, you've done your life review, and you had a life where you were kind of passive. You didn't really have enough oomph. So then you might sojourn, is what Casey would call it, in Mars. And in Mars, you get the energy for your next life. Yes, yeah, so the next lifetime you're going to be, you're going to act first and think later. But then you might, let's say you've had a life where you were too assertive. Then you might sojourn in Venus, where you learn to slow down, you know, smell the flowers, be more artistic and creative, and you'll bring those influences in. And then what Casey really says is that the planetary influences and in our past lives, they get stored in our endocrine system through what we call the chakras. So then your, your incarnation, like the, your astrology is so important because that's what you've been doing in between lives that crystallizes in the body, the moment the soul enters the physical body. And then you have now in your endocrine system, you have your past life influences that play out emotionally. And then you have your astrological influences that are very deep in the subconscious mind. They're basically essences of who you are. And so now you're prepared for your next life. And the astrology, let's say, let's say you had past lifetimes where you were angry, you had problems with anger. Well, then you might have the Mars placement very prominently so that you have to deal with your anger. Not that you get to pardon it, but that you have, like I have my moon in Aries. So I've always had, as a child, I had a temper. And so as I learned about Casey and astrology, it's because I've chosen in this life to learn how to control uh, anger and control my temper. But that's just, again, that's just astrological. So it's deep in my subconscious. And then um, the past life influences are emotional. They'll play out the way that you feel about people and situations and, and those sorts of things. So then your pre-life planning becomes you have your astrological influences to help you out and also to make you face issues. And then you pick the, um, the issues that you want to work on. And then you pick also a council. So you have a council of guides that are going to be with you. Some of them your whole life. Some of them are going to incarnate. And sometimes your council may be added on to by, let's say you have a grandparent that's really close to you. When they pass away, they may well join your council. So you, you, the way I look at it is that a person is like the CEO of a corporation and the corporation is your life. It's your, your family and all these sort of things. But every CEO reports to a board of directors and your council is like your board of directors and every night you consult with those. Now in the regression, you can contact your guides and you can contact your board of directors or your council and they will be quite, um, they'll express to you explicitly what they tell you when you're sleeping. So when you're sleeping, you get this information, but you don't always remember it when you wake up, but you can get access to that. It's a little bit like I look at a regression. Uh, you've heard of near-death experiences, like a near-death experience. A person has a, a tremendous awakening. Well, I think a regression is like a smaller version of a near-death experience. It happens at, in the same places in consciousness. Mm -hmm. So then you have this... Um, Council and you've kind of reviewed your life and you kind of go, yeah, I didn't do so good there. Then, mm -hmm. then how do you, from that, do you then choose where you're coming back? Question number one. Question number two is, are there souls? Michael Newton talks about something like a soul pod. Yes. Like you have a group of souls that are kind of the, the people from whom you pick when you soul go groups. 
the next life. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I, apparently since the beginning, since we first started kind of projecting ourselves into matter, since we first started visiting the earth, we, you know, we had like, you, you sat next to somebody at the class. It's like when we first started coming into the earth, there was a little, there was a soul that was next to us, soul that right, and that we formed relationships with these souls, and then they eventually become our our soul group, and so those are the the group of souls that we have created our relationships with and our karma with. Some of it is really good, some of it is challenging, and that's those they become the most important players in our life. And your inner city, your your inner core soul group is probably about six or eight souls that you predominantly incarnate with. So your parents are part of your soul group, your siblings, and very significant relationships and people that are in your life. That would be the six or eight people. And then you have another, like a suburban soul group, another 20, 30 souls that you incarnate sometimes with, but not as often as your, your core group. And then different people at different lifetimes we have where we're, we reach more people. So when you've had a big influential life, you have a, a very large soul group that you can draw upon. So some of us have soul groups that are in the size in the hundreds. And so those are, we may have a, um, you know, if you're a public figure and you encounter a lot of people, a lot of times you're revisiting, you know, maybe you were a public figure that abused people in a past life. And in this life, you're meeting those souls again to try to make amends. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about what you've learned about a soul contract. We hear those words. What does that mean? Well, you know, mostly most of our karma is with our own self. So most of our karma is in our own energy field. So so we're we have karmic patterns and we'll play them out with different people. And it's not necessarily a soul contract with that individual. So we may have, let's say, self-esteem issues from past lives. And so we may play those out. You know, there's lots of people that are like I like I think the predominant pattern that we're working through in this life, I would call the narcissist and the codependent. And so we may be codependent or narcissistic, and we find individuals that fit with us. They may or may not be from past lives, but we can learn from people that are that fit that pattern. But sometimes we have a contract with a particular soul, and like you have with your husband and your father, and then that individual that soul will come back for us to work on uh, something and usually those are from the uh, our soul group so your father and your husband i would say that in some ways they're you've had many many lifetimes uh working uh together mm -hmm. so so soul contracts are where let's say you've made a you had had a soul contract with the soul of your husband to try to help him progress now eventually when he progresses he may make a contract with you to say, I'm going to support you now, maybe six lifetimes from now, he's going to become a very devoted soul to you. And everybody will say, oh, you're so lucky. You have this wonderful husband. He's so wonderful to you. They won't know that it took you 12 lifetimes to turn him from a wild animal into a human being, you know? Right. And I think also, um, with the whole point that, that you're alluding to is, when we incarnate, when we materialized on the earth, our goal is to improve the quality of our soul. And so all mm -hmm. of these lifetime experiences, good and bad, serve to the point of us learning um, to be better. Mm -hmm. And so these people who choose um, to play roles with us, even if they're total jerks, that, that's a powerful role. I think about that when I think about some of our politicians who by all it, everything you can look at from a human being point of view, they may not look so great, but they play a powerful role in us at least discerning what we want and don't want. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, um, I, I just love that idea. But yeah. let's, take, let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, Peter's going to teach us the points of um, what we can do with our own selves for self-hypnosis for any kind of issue. And Edgar Casey was very, uh, he also thought that was a beautiful idea. So Peter's going to tell us more when we come back. Take a quick break.
Okay, we're back. Before we get into Peter telling us how to do self-hypnosis, Peter, will you tell the listeners how they can reach you or your website if they want to do a session with you? Sure. I, I mean, I do sessions, but I also teach. I teach online and in person. I lead tours. Um, so you can find me with my, my full name.com. So it's Peter Woodbury. Dot com and that's wood and then b-u-r-y dot com and you'll find everything you need to know about me perfect all right talk to us about self-hypnosis yeah well um uh, hypnosis is, is, a, is a kind of popularly misunderstood concept like people think trance states are very exotic like they think that hypnotic states are like oh my god it's really weird and we have to understand that Hypnotic states or trance states are very common. We experience them every day. Like in order to go to sleep, you have to go through different uh, trance states. So between wakefulness and sleep, the mind opens to suggestion. And that's what we call hypnosis, the suggestibility of the mind that's achieved between wakefulness and sleep. So a uh, common experience that, or for some, for some people is meditation. Meditation is a state where you kind of enter into an in-between state. You're not quite awake, you're not quite asleep. So you're in a suggestible state. And so the, actually the KC form of meditation is a, is a type of self-hypnosis because you're, you're in a trance state and you're repeating to yourself a spiritual affirmation. So you're training your mind and you're training your consciousness towards that, you know, let's say it's love or peace or oneness. If you're in a trance state and you're saying oneness, you're going to become more like that, like you're steering your consciousness toward those states of consciousness. So if somebody wants to do, for example, what I do, how I learned to apply self-hypnosis is if you have a relationship in your life that is pesky, you, know, you just kind of like wonder, why, what's up with me and this person? Why, why, why do we misunderstand each other? Or why can I live with them, but I can't live without them? You know, you know, all these type of things, or um, you have a pattern, like, why do I keep dating this type of person? Or why am I always alone? Or why don't things work out for me the way that I like to? So let's say you identify either a relationship or a pattern that you want to work on. Then the next thing you'd want to do is try to understand or entertain the feeling that goes with that. So the relationship, what's the feeling like? Oh, frustration, misunderstanding, or loneliness, or whatever feeling it is. So then what you do is you would go into like a meditation. You close your eyes, and you just try to, when your mind wanders, you try to focus back on that feeling. And you just say, I'm going to meditate, and I'm going to self-hypnotize towards this feeling. And what will happen, what oftentimes happen, is that if you can kind of mind wanders, keep coming back to this frustration or this loneliness, then oftentimes you'll get into some kind of an understanding of where that is coming from. So for example, I remember having a relationship with um, a woman, and this was after college, and she was delightful. She was just very free spirited. And she was also like her body matched her nature because she had hyper flexible joints. And so one time she danced herself right out of her knees, they hyper extended. And so she had to have surgery. So she had these big scars on the sides of her knees because they had to reattach the tendons because they had uh, torn. So that's just an aside. But I what would happen is that she would be so kind of loosey goosey that I would get really mad at her. And she'd get really surprised and I'd get really surprised, but why, what, what, why was I getting so triggered? So I wanted to understand that relationship. So I didn't go to a regressionist. I just went with that feeling. I just tried to meditate on this frustration, on her, you know, how much I cared about her, what a nice person she was, but why I would get so frustrated. So after a few minutes, what came to me is I saw myself as a very stern um, landowner that's what came to me landowner in south america and i ruled my family like i had a corporation and i ruled my wife and my children and they were all supposed to be like little soldiers they were all supposed to be emblematic of that god had given us good fortune and that we were wealthy because god wanted it that way and then we had another child and this child was born with polio and this child had to have the braces on their on their legs and this child like 
would upset me so much that I had to deal with having a handicapped child. Like I felt it was a negative reflection on the family that it broke this magic spell. I wanted everybody to believe that we were somehow a perfect God blessed family. And that child was her. And it helped me understand why I was triggered from the past life. I was trying to heal with her that uh, pattern. So that's one of the ways that you can do it in a self hypnosis. Basically the, the, the more you learn how to hip, uh, the more you learn how to meditate, the more naturally you can enter into trance states. So it's very much a meditative trance state. Work on the feelings. Maybe you can visualize that person or whatever it is. If it's loneliness, the pattern, it, usually it's very poignant. And then go into it. Instead of trying to run away from it, try to go into it and then see what, uh, what comes forth. And I really trust this process because you're never going to get more than you're ready for. It's, not, it's going to be very gentle. It might give you just a couple of images and then you'll wake up. And that'll be all that you're... And sometimes you can get more, of course, if you're with somebody else there holding the space with you. Do you see any value to, for example, you have a, an affirmation. Do you see any value to recording it in your voice and using that to help you be meditative? Yes. The, the, you know, it's like... Um, I, uh, Edgar Casey talked a lot about pre-sleep suggestions and there's like a seven to 12 minutes between when you're going to bed and you're tired. Most people fall asleep in seven to 12 minutes. I don't, I don't fall asleep that quickly anymore, but I remember when I used to, but so you can, you can make a recording and you can put in the recording, repeat the kind of aspects that you want to become more of, like you want to exercise. You'd say, oh my God, it feels so good to work out. I love going out and swimming and, and, and running, or I love eating salads or whatever it is you're, you're wanting to entrain your mind towards. And you just make a, a nice, lovely you know, uh, loop of those suggestions. And you can listen to it as you're falling asleep. And you will see that that does influence you, that you begin to subconsciously start to like salads more or exercise more. And one, I'll make I'll make recordings for people for them to listen. So sometimes people don't like to hear their own voices recorded, but so I, sometimes I'll do it for them. One thing I want to just say to everybody, um, hypnosis, it feels like, you know, somebody's going to make you do something out of your control because when right. you have people on stage, um, they might yeah. say, you know, hop, hop like a, duck or a quack like or, a duck. yeah something mm -hmm. but you aren't ever going to do anything that your subconscious doesn't agree to um so if you're if you're worried about that the truth is you are still i like to say you're a sovereign entity you still decide the, mm -hmm. your essence your spirit your subconscious is going to put the brakes on if it's not yes. So yes. that's, I think I just want to reassure people that yeah. even though you may be in a trance state, nothing is going to be done to you that you don't agree to. Right. And essentially, like you're saying, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. If, you know, if, if somebody comes to me and says, I don't think you could hypnotize me, I'd say, yeah, you're right. I can hypnotize you. <laughs> you, know, if, you if you don't want to be hypnotized, it's, it's hard right. enough for some people who really want to. But if, if you don't think you can be hypnotized, there's nobody can do it for you. If you, have to, you have to be willing. You have to want it to happen. And then even then, sometimes for some people, it's a challenge. But nothing is ever done against your will. And I think the good example of that is I was willing to be vulnerable um, and the story comes out about a rape because yeah. the healing that came from that, my soul knew yeah. um, there was a big benefit for yeah. that. Well, we're I, out I of find, time. Oh, go ahead. We're uh, out of I time. I was just going to say that, that oh, okay, we'll, we'll no, go ahead, continue please. that people can reach me anytime and I'll be happy to continue conversation. Wonderful. So Peter Woodbury, um, his website is his name, peterwoodbury.com. Um, go with him on a trip. Where are you going coming up? I'm going to, in November, I'm going to Egypt and we're going to, we're going to do the ceremony in the King's uh, chamber, the sarcophagus, which is like a regression. The soul leaves the body back then it was three days. We won't do it for three days, but we'll, we'll One do year. that ceremony. And then in and next year in March, we'll be going to Peru. 
Wonderful. So everybody, I'm Doc Martin. This has been Maximum Medicine Radio with Peter Woodbury. Thank you so much for being here with us. Edvin, thank you for producing us. Peter, I'm so happy to have you here. It was wonderful Thank talk. you. Thanks for having me. All right. Good night. You've been listening to Maximum Medicine Radio with Doc Martin. Tune in next time while the doc talks health, spirituality, and the impact your beliefs have on every part of who you are, body and soul. Doc Martin unpacks the challenges we face as human beings and teaches callers to open the door between the scientific and the mystical. To learn more about Doc Martin and Maximum Medicine, visit www.sharonmartinmd.com.